Hello, everyone, and welcome to Future Cities Laboratory podcast. I'm your host, Panmi, and today we begin our three-part series on global responses to COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemics are not new, and cities have battled several of them time and again. But this time around, we have a new tool in our arsenal, digital technologies that are helping smart cities to detect, diagnose, monitor, and respond to the COVID-19 virus. Today, in our first installment of the talk, we will talk about how cities around the world are employing digital technologies to improve their response to the coronavirus. We have with us Callum Hanforth from Smart Cities and Digitalization Program in UNDP, Global Center for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development here in Singapore. And we will discuss how technology can facilitate COVID-19 response and recovery. Has it been effective and has it been replicable? Welcome, Callum. Great to have you here today. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. So since you're working with digital technologies for smart cities in UNDP, I want to begin by asking you, what exactly does smart city mean for you? It's a great question because uh, smart cities is a concept that we talk about a lot, um, but often don't uh, unpack in great detail. So for UNDP, smart cities are about technology and innovation. And for us, the reason we say technology and innovation is it's very important to not be technology focused. Um, innovation is just as important, particularly in many of the countries where we work, where things like behavior change, indigenous knowledge, and nature-based solutions are all equally important. More widely as well, for us, smart cities are about creating inclusive, livable, um, and sustainable urban areas. So founded on this kind of technology and innovation, um, but also engaging with the wider areas of the city. So informal settlements, rural and urban linkages, and the kind of wider urban environment as well. For us, smart cities are an essential development priority at UNDP and more widely. Across the world, urbanization is increasing, particularly happening at the fastest pace in, in lower income settings. And the quality of life for many people is also reducing in cities. And again, this is particularly the case in, in lower income countries. There's also a need for us to make smart cities a more global concept um, and not just something that's associated with a Barcelona, a London, or obviously here in Singapore. And this is why we created a, a dedicated smart cities and digitalization program at the UNDP Global Center. And how do you think these smart cities are faring in these unprecedented times? Are they better prepared or has this whole pandemic thrown these smart cities off course? So for us, uh, a smart city is a, an urban environment that meets the needs and realities of its citizens, um, and also in the kind of wider context, which might be a pandemic, uh, it might be climate change, it might be economic or societal factors such as inequality. And these are always going to be in flux and, and dynamic. So decision makers and policy makers need to be able to respond to these challenges and crises um, and other priorities. And this is for us why a smart city is especially important. So it's about using this technology and innovation to provide decision makers with the engagement with their populations, with the insights needed to kind of build better places to live and to work. And these tools can also support citizens and others in improving their lives um, and livelihoods too. In the context of COVID-19, particularly as we see uh, countries and cities with strong digitalization foundations were able to respond particularly well at the, at the uh, initial stages of the outbreak. So looking at places like obviously Singapore, uh, South Korea, Vietnam in the region in particular. And then when we think about the, the kind of wider COVID recovery, so things like remote working, e-commerce, um, all going to be increasingly important as we go forward. So what we're looking for is ensuring that digital and uh, innovation are the kind of foundation of a smart city. And then more widely, particularly at times of crisis, particularly where more marginalized groups of people can be disproportionately affected, we need to ensure that smart cities are a truly inclusive con concept. So no one should be left behind by the potential afforded by these concepts or by technology and innovation. And we need to really make sure that smart cities work for everyone. So you talk about these technological innovations and how they've been instrumental in preparing a response. I was curious about specific technological implementations. If you have any examples. Yeah, um, so as we've just mentioned, uh, digital has been a really key element of response and recovery in the context of COVID. So digital has kind of driven an, an effective public health response in many countries, but it's also shaped and, and accelerated a kind of unprecedented shift in how we live and how we work, and also how we've enjoyed ourselves. 
um, but also it's driven other essential elements of the response. So in a number of countries in which we're working across sub-Saharan Africa and Asia Pacific, tools such as chatbots have been developed to obviously um, allow people to connect and engage with government uh, in an era of lockdown and, and closed public services. We're also seeing wider acceleration of innovation. So our country office in Nepal has been deploying very basic robots designed with the kind of local maker community there to support nurses and doctors and other healthcare workers in engaging with patients. More widely as well, we're also working with a number of partners, such as mobile network operators and the wider private sector, to understand more about how people are changing their behavior. And this is going to let us design better urban environments through using you know, mobile network data and, and other initiatives to understand how COVID-19 has, has shaped and shifted people's lives and, and livelihoods. More widely as well, at the Global Center, we've been collating a, a series of open source tools um, and these are digital tools that have been proven in other communicable disease outbreaks, such as the Ebola outbreak a few years ago, and also other public health and, and wider crises, and making these available to, to country officers and also their national government partners. And the exciting element here is that we're not duplicating anything. We're building on proven and expansive and successful efforts. And through making one tool available, for example, one of our partner governments has saved over kind of four million US dollars instead of going for a kind of private sector solution. Beyond the kind of response stage, though, we're also seeing that uh, digital is going to be a really kind of crucial aspect of, of recovery from the kind of pandemic. Firstly, this is going to be for things like connectivity efforts, so better rollout of 3G and 4G networks in, in many of the countries that we work in, which are going to be fundamental in driving e-commerce, remote working, and also obviously public service delivery. But we're also going to be needing to build the skills of, of government and, and public sector and public officials to kind of respond to the challenges and, and some of the opportunities that COVID-19 has created. One example we're doing here is soon to launch a multi-city challenge across a number of cities in, in sub-Saharan Africa. We'll be working very closely with public sector officials to work on skills like problem definition, design thinking, and to allow them to, to go to and work with citizens on, on designing solutions that will meet the needs of citizens in a very new world. Um, also, we've been working across a number of other countries in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly focusing on what the, the changes to the kind of public environment mean in, in the context of, of COVID recovery. So, for example, how do we do market trading? Because things like social distancing are going to limit how markets work in, in a number of countries. What does road traffic and um, pedestrianization look like as well? You know, how can we look at things like big data to, to replan urban environments? How can we look at mobile payment platforms and another technology to improve how SMEs and others operate in these countries? And then also, again, from the Global Center, we've been working with a number of technology partners such as Google, AWS, Arm, and NVIDIA, and about 15 or so partners globally now, to run what we call an open source uh, hardware challenge where we've been calling on a global open source community of, of makers and innovators. And it's truly global. We're seeing submissions from, from Seattle, from, from Poland, from Nigeria, from Singapore, to actually identify and develop promising hardware solutions that can be applied in a, in a low resource environment. And a lot of these are really exciting for, for two reasons. The first is obviously they provide tools and resources in a context where supply chains may not be functioning or may not be functioning as, as well as they could be. So providing a kind of immediate response in, in particularly difficult settings. But secondly, they catalyze a kind of local innovation ecosystems as well. So provide opportunities for entrepreneurs and other partners in those countries and economies to then drive COVID recovery as well. So really exciting about what building products and services that people, because they're open source, can then make their own and become entrepreneurs and others and respond to obviously the, the significant economic challenge that COVID-19 has had in, in many locations. Yeah, it seems like there's a whole diverse range of implementations that you talked about, and uh, they seem like great initiatives on their own, but I wonder if they can simply be transplanted to another location. And I'll give you an example. In FCL, we've been engaging directly with the city of Makassar in Indonesia, and we're helping them analyze their COVID-19 data using Earthscape, which is a data visualization platform we developed here. And we use this to maintain a live database of cases, and then we analyze changes in accessibility so that we can identify vulnerable areas in the city. Of course, this has helped us tremendously in maintaining timely communication of information and also eases some of the planning tasks, but we've struggled with many challenges. Specifically, at the initial stages, there's insufficient data availability to begin with. And then interpreting this data is difficult for planners who are so new to these digital tools and technologies. How do you think we can maximize our effectiveness in cases like this and replicate and scale these digital solutions? 
Excellent. So I think you've touched upon a really interesting point here, and it's actually something that we come across a lot. So the reason we stress that technology and innovation are fundamental components to smart cities is it's really important to not be technology-led. A lot of the times, actually, we find that technology can be the easier part. A lot of the time, technology has been proven, it's relatively off the shelf, standards have been developed or been applied elsewhere. In fact, the trickier part in any kind of digital technology or innovation initiative is the culture and the behavior change. So how do we convince decision makers, policy makers, or even citizens and other partners about the importance of, of these tools and initiatives? Um, might be, you know, why do we need their data? Why do we want to, to partner with a particular organization? Or the value add that these tools can bring to, to these kind of situations. And I think in, in this example in particular, it's about demonstrating value. And this is especially important for also a lot of the work that we do. Um, show why these tools can improve their lives, livelihoods, make their life easier, you know, improve their access to public services or, or gaining government benefits or, or new opportunities. It's all about kind of grounding them in, in the kind of realities of their lives in terms of actually implementing these and, and ensuring the sustainability. And then building on that as well, it's also about being open to, to learning as well. A lot of the time, particularly in international development, we are quite reluctant to share stories of successes and even more reluctant to share stories of our kind of failures or challenges. Um, but I think in these kind of contexts, it's especially important to be learning from each other so we can replicate how things work, particularly so we don't keep making the same mistakes. And again, digital is a, is a great opportunity here because it's a channel that the barriers to entry are much lower, allows more people to jump in, and things like open source as well allows people to, to build solutions very easily. But if we're not sharing learning and we're not testing or learning um, from what we're doing, then we're going to be making the same mistakes each time. So we need to establish strong cultural foundations, learning, open data sharing, in order for these solutions to be effective. And in some cases, I feel like maybe the, these solutions can even be counterproductive without these foundations. And I'm talking about uh, the fears of privacy intrusion and cyber attacks in this case. Uh, so these are all tied to a deeper question of trust or lack of trust in technology, maybe in governance structures, maybe a lack of trust in people. But how do we overcome this? And are there any guidelines that, or lessons you've learned from other cities in this regard? Yeah, many, many lessons learned and we're increasingly uh, showing blogs and others on exactly this topic. So just to, to reaffirm what I just mentioned, technology adoption is increasingly often a journey. So it's all about engaging with your users, which in this case often is going to be citizens. And again, to highlight why they should be interested in, in your kind of policy or solution. What we see in a lot of places is that often a lot of governments or solution providers will impose ideas or technology from the top down. And this is sometimes tricky, particularly when building more sustainable solutions, because you're not engaging with the needs and realities of, of your users or your citizens. So what we need is it to be a kind of consultative, inclusive, and ideally grassroots process, which is why your URScape um, tool that you just mentioned is, is a really exciting initiative here. It's about building that kind of collaboration, particularly so governments can be understanding what the realities of citizens are and building solutions that are actually relevant in these uh, settings. So listening and, and learning from, from your population. And then linked to that, it's about showing value. So how can what uh, the policy or the initiative do that improves people's lives or livelihoods? So demonstrate, show, and explain to people what we use a lot as case studies or examples from elsewhere, but increasingly as well, the importance of piloting and scaling, testing, learning, and adapting. So don't go straight to a finished solution when a lot of these problems like cybersecurity and others are going to be catastrophic at scale. Learn um, at a smaller scale, figure out what works and what doesn't, and then build up from there as well. Again, that kind of journey is really, really important. And we've got a lot of tools on our website that we're building around that. Finally, though, I think in the context of cybersecurity and, and other issues like this, and particularly data usage, accountability is, is absolutely crucial and really non-negotiable. So governments need to be held accountable for their successes and their failures um, as to partners like technology companies and others. And that also needs to be oversight, a technical, legal, and a wider setting a set, sense as well on how technology is being used or misused. Um, and this includes increasingly skills, knowledge, and awareness of citizens as well. So they have a digital literacy to protect themselves, but also to hold governments to account. And a lot of the time that digital divide is often forgotten about in the accountability conversation, but it's a really, really important component. Finally, I always like to end with a question on the future. In what ways do you think a research program like ours, FCL, can support future pandemic mitigation issues and what aspects should we be looking out for? 
It's a really, really tricky question. So I think just to pick up my, my last point just then, it's all about that inclusion aspect, the digital divide and, and the kind of wider importance of, of leaving no one behind. So what we've seen with COVID-19, it's been a truly global challenge and very, very few communities have been left unaffected or in, in the same way that they were before. So identifying kind of future challenges like COVID-19, we'll need to basically be engaging with all populations so we can see other issues coming and to understand how to solve them. And that requires being adaptable and responsive and also resilient and able to change our ways of living and working. And that's why digital foundations are going to be really essential here, but also smart cities more broadly, you know, how we're using technology and innovation to inform decision making, to bring solutions that are sustainable and to broadly improve um, people's lives in that kind of urban environment as well. Thanks, Callum. This was very, very informative for me. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Very much so. Thank you. All right. Coming up next time, the second part of the series on governance and policy responses to COVID-19 pandemic. Bye-bye.